uh, public safety uh, 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 town hall, virtual town hall, uh, with my friend and uh, San Jose City Council, um, Magdalena Carrasco. We have a slew of uh, top uh, public safety law enforcement officials, agencies here with us to talk about uh, how can we keep ourselves safe and during this uh, pandemic and also you know, in the days and the months to come. I know this uh, crisis has brought so much uh, uh, stress to, to so many of us in terms of uh, financial stress, that's the utmost one, emotional and physical uh, stress, but uh, it definitely also brought on a lot of stress to our uh, public safety arena. That's why I'm hosting uh, this uh, 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 a virtual town hall because we noticed that there was a surge of a uh, hate crime against uh, Asian, and also there's uh, we know there's a very much underreported domestic violence uh, cases uh, uh, ha happening when people are sheltered at home. So making home not necessarily a safe place. We also know there's a, a lot of vandalism uh, targeting toward the uh, commercial uh, properties, you know, uh, and also car break-ins and so on and so forth. And also uh, there's a huge uh, spike on the scam. You know, the bad guys are taking this uh, situation to target uh, not just the vulnerable uh, community, but all of the, 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 the people. So <clears throat> the, uh, ha having this town hall hopefully will give us some um, ideas, you know, how to provide us with some uh, safety hit, hint. And also I know there's uh, still a shortage of uh, PPE devices and many of the, uh, the, the police the department, the frontline uh, first responder. So I will ask the uh, police uh, uh, chief captains to pre pretty much uh, please provide us with uh, some information. Uh, where can we drop out some uh, PPE, donate some PPE device to, to your agencies? And before I uh, got on to this town hall, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about what the, the current status of the, the state during this crisis. You know, we, in the beginning, we are, uh, what the highest priority is to make sure that we can slow the spread of this virus. And secondly, to make sure that our uh, hospital uh, have the capacity of handling the worst case uh, as a scenario. And uh, we're going back to San Clemente on May 4th, and we'll be focusing on the, the, the budget. You know, uh, it's gonna be a, a tough one. Uh, we, we know that uh, th this is really caused a lot of uh, uh, damages to our uh, economy. So, but the state uh, by constitution need to pass the budget uh, by June 15th. So we'll be going back and talk about uh, the budget and, and the recovery from this uh, uh, pandemic. A uh, couple of the area that I will be focusing on, which I have been focusing on for the, the uh, last six years is really uh, for public safety. Public safety is definitely uh, the one. And secondly, it would be the mental health services, uh, school-based mental health, as well as providing mental health to those people that don't have access to mental health. The third one is uh, education. We know that uh, the, the, the student lost a good uh, amount of uh, uh, instructional time this year. And uh, how can we and uh, get them back on, on track it will be uh, also a focus of mine. And definitely the uh, economic uh, recovery is, is a, a big, 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 big thing. 
So uh, briefly, I, I, I wanted just to share of the, some of the build that I'll be focusing on, which is uh, one was the AB1107, <coughs> excuse me, and that bill was, was pushed for an extension of uh, additional $600 per week for those people that uh, are under any employment check. And this is uh, after the uh, federal program run, run out. So, uh, so uh, the, I know the unemployment issue is a big issue for so many of us. I just wanted to ask you to be patient. The state has um, uh, moved more than a thousand uh, people to, to EDD to handle the, the spike of the, uh, the unemployment claim. And I know that we're still not doing a good job. We need to put more resources so you'll be able to get your check sooner than later. But one thing for sure is that EDD uh, payment is the retrofit. So um, you might have to wait a little bit longer, but you, you should have, you should be able to get the full uh, uh, amount as we uh, clear up this uh, spikes. And the other bill I want to talk about is I, I really wanted to make sure that large corporation in the county you know, step up the play to help us with the uh, economic recovery. So uh, I have a bill, AB385, trying to, is, is to ask the uh, larger companies to pay a, a, a headcount or employee tax. And that money will go to the county and the, the city as well as the school. Uh, instead of just going to the city for the uh, uh, for the housing project, so this is a, a, a going to be a, a uphill battle. And the other one was to uh, make sure that the uh, public safety uh, specific uh, legislation. I want to thank the chief uh, Patterson for giving me the idea. And uh, this will be AB twenty three seventy five. Something uh, some some. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bill that we've been discussing with the district attorney as well as the ch uh, Chief Patterson, which is to uh, increase the penalty of those uh, stealing personal electronic devices that uh, hold valuable personal information or uh, industrial uh, or work-related information to make it into an automatic felony. And this bill will also create a statewide database for all the stolen goods. So anyone can access to this database and tell whether or not they are uh, buying something that was uh, stolen or to recover uh, uh, some of their pro uh, personal property that has been stolen. And the other one I'd like to touch uh, on a little bit is a uh, bill to create a better procedure to deal with hate and bias event requiring more uh, detailed reporting on the hate crime and, and uh, incidents uh, for the police. So pretty much if the police in, uh, identify that a, a crime and thing is a hate related crime, we'll ask them to fill up a, a supplemental report. I know this will add a, uh, more work to the, to, to the uh, frontline police officers, but the benefit will be to provide more information, uh, timely information for the district attorney to prosecute those cases. And uh, back to, to today's town hall, I wanted to uh, again provide you with the general tips for staying safe along with information about cr crime trends during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. There will be time for questions from, from the audience. And uh, there's a couple of options that you'll be able to submit your question. If you are on Facebook Live, just uh, make a comment on Facebook Live and we'll see it. And, uh, and uh, uh, our staff will uh, uh, sort it out and uh, provide a chance to ask that question. Or you can all, uh, email to assemblymember chu assemblymember chu at assembly.ca.gov. 
and we will answer those questions toward the end of this uh, uh, town hall. And if for any reason that we don't have time to answer your question, uh, please feel free to contact my office. I'll make sure that those questions will get to the, the, the right uh, uh, agency and get an answer uh, for you uh, quickly. So before we begin, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the co-host, um, uh, a good friend of mine, council member Magdalena Carrasco. She has been a strong advocate for public safety, especially in the domestic violence uh, issues and, uh, and, so, and so many, uh, I don't, I wanted to give uh, council member Magdalena a few minutes to talk. Uh, thank you, uh, assembly member. Chu and uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to co-host with you. Uh, this is this is such a, a great opportunity for us to reach out to our constituents and to all the residents in our great state of California. But I really want to thank all of our law enforcement uh, representatives that are here. Look at this wonderful panel that is represented here today to be able to speak on such an important subject, which is public safety. And of course, it comes in so many different ways. But of course, with uh, the challenges that we're now facing with COVID-19, otherwise known as coronavirus, uh, we really are, are facing uh, many other challenges and how we address that is going to be uh, really the new wave of doing business uh, here, not just in California, but really uh, globally. We weren't anticipating what we're seeing. Uh, uh, we were getting ready for different kinds of uh, emergencies and, and uh, natural disasters. Little did we know that we were going to be facing a pandemic that literally stopped us in our tracks. Uh, you know, it was like uh, crashing into a brick wall. Suddenly everything came to a, a screeching halt. So I'm, I'm grateful to have all of you here with us to address, I think, some very pertinent questions and, and issues that are really on everybody's mind. Domestic violence, how we deal with uh, vandalism and uh, burglaries, how we deal with uh, family safety, and how we keep our kids uh, uh, above everything else safe and how we secure their future. And so I represent the east side of San Jose. Uh, I, I see Captain Ta who's here. And of course our, uh, our uh, wonderful DA Jeff Rosen who represents uh, the county of Santa Clara. Many others who are representing us uh, in a, a very uh, respectful and dignified manner. And I really do appreciate your service. Uh, a couple of things that I really do want to address uh, that we're doing in the city of San Jose, of course, public safety comes in many different ways and it takes a collective effort and it does take a village to raise our uh, families. So uh, we've been very busy, really busier, I think, now that we're uh, sheltering in place, uh, trying to be very creative in how we do outreach, how we connect with our families how we keep everybody safe. Uh, public safety is uh, of paramount, but uh, uh, the public health is uh, become very critical. We, we have a stay, uh, uh, a shelter in place, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was a mandate by the county, of course, also by our governor. Uh, it, was, it was a necessary uh, mandate which uh, meant that suddenly our economy came to a halt. People are left without an income. There's a lot of challenges that come with that. So a couple of things that we've done in the city to protect our families is uh, we, we put in place a sick leave, a mandatory sick, paid sick leave, which uh, ensures the public safety. That means that if you're impacted by COVID-19 or you're taking care of a family member, we don't want you uh, handling our food. We don't want you at the grocery store. We don't want, you, even if you're an essential worker, we don't want you out there uh, risking the rest of us or risking yourself. We want you to stay home and take care of yourself. And we want you not to have to decide whether you you get paid or uh, take care of yourself. So we're, we're mandating, uh, uh, especially small businesses to take care of you by paying you so you can take care of yourself. Uh, we're also putting a moratorium on evictions. That's not a moratorium on your rent. Uh, you're still going to have to pay your rent. You're still responsible for that, but you are safe from being evicted, at least until the 31st 
of May. And then after that, you have 120 days to pay your back rent. Now, we're hoping that we're going to be able to extend that because we know that even after we lift the uh, stay order, people are not going to be able to get back to work as quickly as we would hope. And the economy is not going to um, uh, return to what we used to, what we were used to and what we were uh, accustomed to. By all intents and purposes, it's going to be a very slow process. Uh, the economy is going to open up very, very slowly. Not everybody's going to go back to work at, at the pace that we'd like. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to extend that, or at least that our landlords are going to be very compassionate and empathetic and that they're going to be able to work something out with their renters. We want to make sure that we don't have mass um, uh, evictions and we don't see folks out on the street. And so we are either going to extend the moratorium or uh, hoping that we're going to be able to work something out with our landlords. Of course, uh, uh, we've been working with a lot of partners. We wouldn't be able to do this on our own. This is a, uh, a, a mass partnership that, uh, that uh, calls for all hands on deck in order to make sure that we're meeting the needs of, uh, of not just the city of San Jose, but we have a partnership with the Santa Clara County, which means that we're feeding over 2 million folks uh, um, on a weekly basis. We went from 1.2 meals a week to now 2 million meals that the city of San Jose is in charge of. Uh, this, the county of Santa Clara is doing uh, uh, other, they're in charge of other responsibilities, but they've asked us to be in charge of food distribution. And so uh, it requires a lot of partnerships through the school districts, through nonprofits, which means that we've, uh, we've increased uh, their, their grants in order to be able to do that. Of course, we've also opened up uh, many uh, beds for our houseless, population, which includes over 500 hotel rooms in order to be able to get our houseless population off of the streets. And we're still working on making sure that our, our uh, houseless population uh, is also able to uh, uh, shelter in place and be able to secure their, their uh, well-being and their health. So um, uh, the other thing that I just wanted to quickly mention, you know, uh, since all of this started, we've seen an uptick, and I'm sure that our, uh, our officers here and our representatives will talk about the increase in hate crimes are against our API community. We have a no tolerance in the city of San Jose. We just passed a resolution just last week. Um, we, we are an inclusive city. We believe that the diversity of our city is our strength, not our weakness. We will stand by our API community uh, and we will not tolerate that. We have seen a rash of uh, vandalism. Uh, I know that I spoke with Captain Ta about that just a couple of days ago. We don't know what the root of the cause is. I can't ascertain that. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our, our folks are, are, are uh, busy investigating that. We'll find out sooner uh, uh, versus later uh, because we have great officers at work looking into that. But regardless of what it is, we're not going to tolerate that. And so we stand with our API community and uh, making sure that, uh, that they understand that um, that uh, that's not to be tolerated, whether, whether it's now or later. But uh, uh, again, our diversity is our strength. And, and the last thing that I do want to mention, which is a, a huge concern to me, is uh, the issue of family violence or domestic violence. And we just got off of, a, of, a, of a, another Zoom uh, conversation. Uh, of course, our, our DA was uh, a part of that uh, very important conversation. This is uh, uh, the month where we highlight and bring awareness to sexual assault and domestic violence. Across the country, we've seen an uptick in the number of incidents of domestic violence. And, and of course, domestic violence and sexual assault is an, a crime of opportunity. And we are sheltering in place. What greater opportunities than when you have your victim uh, there with you 24 seven with no opportunities for your victim to leave the home, to seek help, to make those phone calls. So we're very concerned about uh, those survivors, uh, those individuals who may be running a higher risk because uh, they are now sheltering in place with their uh, assailant, with the perpetrator or with the individual that might cause them harm. We want to make sure that uh, women, children, 
uh, anyone that might feel that they are in, uh, in um, harm's way knows where to seek help. If they're unable to call for help, we have a, a, another opportunity for them to, uh, to, to get help, which is simply by texting 911. Uh, they don't even have to have anybody on the line. They can just text 911 and in the message bar, they can put their name in there and their address, send it off. And, uh, and the person that might be hurting them won't even have to hear the actual message that's being uh, communicated. But what I'd like to say also about this is that uh, domestic violence is very, very serious. Many people still are under the belief that this is a family affair, that it is a private affair. It is not a private affair. It is very much uh, a societal issue and we need to get involved. So if you're a neighbor, if you're a loved one, if you're a family member and you're aware of this, it may be that it, it, the responsibility falls on your shoulders and you may be the one that needs to make that phone call. Our children are no longer in school. They don't have a trusted adult that they can turn to or a friend that they can confide in. So you may be the one that needs to make that phone call for that child or for the adult in the home that can't make the call for themselves. And you may be very well saving someone's life. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you, assembly member, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing at the state level. This is going to be a very difficult um, several months that we see ahead of ourselves, maybe even uh, a very difficult year ahead of us. And so the policy that you will be pushing forward, especially when it comes to mental health, uh, especially when it, uh, when it comes to supporting our kids, but especially as we try to recover economically is going to make all the difference in the world. We are one of the largest and one of the strongest powerhouse uh, uh, economies in the world. Uh, and so all eyes are on us. And what we do, whether it's public safety, whether it's uh, social justice, whether it's economic recovery, the world will be looking to see how we lead. And so I thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. I think that these conversations are critical, and I think that they are uh, incredibly important for our residents and for every Californian who is watching us today. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Council Member Carrasco. You know, definitely thank you for your update. You know, it's been a great honor and a privilege for me to be able to uh, serve as the uh, State Assembly and join hands with many of our good congressional leaders and uh, county leaders as well as the city leaders to uh, address this issue. Uh, like uh, council member mentioned that the recovery is definitely will be the focus uh, once we get back to uh, Sacramento, Sacramento on May 4th. So let's get to the most important part of this town hall. Uh, I'd like to introduce all the panelists uh, all at once. And I, I believe this is actually in their speaking uh, order. And first up, I'd like to introduce a good friend of mine, is the District Attorney Nancy O'Malley from Alameda County District Office. Uh, Nancy has been a, a strong colleague of mine and have uh, proposed many of the good uh, public safety bills uh, uh, to my office. And the second one up, we'll have our Santa Clara County uh, uh, District Attorney, as well as the Chief Assistant at, uh, Jay Bo uh, Boyaski with us. And uh, under Sheriff uh, Rick Song from Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, as, and uh, Chief, for, uh, po Police Chief from City of Fremont, um, Tim Peterson, and also Santa Clara uh, Police Department Police Chief, uh, just e elected, but it will be sworn in on uh, next Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Pat Nikolai, also uh, Captain Jason Mark, I think is from the Foothill Division of San Jose PD, which I got to uh, know him very, very well in many of the community uh, meetings. And also from Newark Police Department, we have Chumman Law. And, uh, from the Milpitas Police Department, we have Captain Jared Hernandez. So uh, I'd like to get uh, 
District Attorney Nancy uh, Omali, you're on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assembly Member and Council Member. I'm um, just a real pleasure to be here and thank you for putting together the town hall so that we can make sure that our communities know what's available to be aware and uh, to be forewarned about some scams as assembly member reference. So I wanted to start talking about hate crimes and hate speech. <clears throat> in my county, this Alameda County is the fourth most diverse county in America. And we're very proud of that diversity. We believe as councilwoman said, that our diversity makes us strong. What we, have, what we know is that there is no place in our community for hate speech or hate crimes. So several years back, uh, we created a hate crime, hate speech hotline. I'm gonna give you that number uh, and I will, we'll repeat it later and we'll make it available through the assembly member staff. The phone number that we have for our hate crime is 510 208 4824. The reason why we created the hotline is because we had so many incidents of several years back, and particularly at that time, people, the people who were being targeted were people of the Muslim faith. Oh. And we found that it was incredibly important to step in. Not, we knew that there was more hate speech going on than was actually becoming hate crimes. But what we discovered was that people would report a hate speech, someone who's making a, a racial slur or verbally xenophobic comments. And we would reach out, to, if we knew who the person was who made the comments, who made the speech, we would go reach out to them and talk to them about what they were doing, about trying to educate them and sensitize them about living in a diverse community. And, and what we especially wanted to do was to make sure that, that people knew that we were paying attention because oftentimes the hate speech can lead to hate crimes. And more recently, uh, we've been putting out a lot of information to our community. As, as we heard earlier from the co-host that there's a particular uptick in attacking the Asian community, <clears throat> particularly the Chinese community. So uh, the mayor of Fremont and I, Lily May and I have both uh, recorded public messages about hate crimes and what the commitment that my office has and the commitment that the city of Fremont has to not tolerate it and to take action if we know that there's hate crime or even hate speech that's being uh, affected onto someone else. We've also worked with other Asian leaders across the county, my county, Alameda County, so that we make sure that we're hitting all parts of our county since it's clear that the hate that's being generated uh, very misplaced hate against Chinese Americans during this crisis of COVID-19 is misplaced, it's not appropriate, and Alameda County is better than that. So um, for all that either witness hate crime or hate speech or experience it themselves, please let us know so we can provide either education or if it gives rise to a crime so we can prosecute it. Assembly member, would you like me to cover a few other areas now? You're, uh, you have to unmute. Uh, yes, would, please. Okay. Um, so the uh, uh, council member Orozco really covered this so wonderfully about talking about family violence and domestic violence. And I just want to reiterate that and really join in her comments. Uh, we are very concerned about what's happening inside the homes when people are sheltered in place. We know that there are victims of domestic violence who are now having to be in home with their abusers. We also know that these are very stressful times. And so even in the best of times, people get stressed out. We're very concerned about that. What we've been doing is tracking in Alameda County, the calls for help, which is actually down. And I counsel a woman really said it very uh, clearly, and that is that people don't always have a way to reach out to let someone know that they're in danger or they're being abused. So what we've been doing is we have at our Family Justice Center, we're open, and we are the hub for people to call in if they have a need or they need resources and they need access to something, including housing, because we have had now 230 requests for housing for relocation 
or for temporary housing for victims of domestic violence to be able to get away from their abusers. Uh, and we've recently, uh, so we're now starting to our protocol on how we will provide either hotel vouchers or safety measures for people who are letting us know that they need help. At the Family Justice Center, we're also linking victims into other services like legal services and restraining order services and things that we can all work together on. But importantly, what we're doing is I have uh, seven navigators who work at the Family Justice Center. And the navigators are really designed to help victims figure out where they, what needs they have and where they need to go or how we can provide those services. Our navigators are calling all of the people who have come to the Family Justice Center because they have been victims of domestic violence. And we're just checking in. And this is the place where we're hearing more. We did not hear from 230 people. They did not even know to reach out. But by us calling them and telling them that we're here for them and just making sure they're safe, we're now gathering much more information. And where it looks like there's a critical incident or a critical situation, then we are, sent, we are asking the police to go knock on the door and see what's happening. Um, the, other, the other component of our advocacy around domestic violence is that seven years back, we created an electronic medical record. We call it DVRR, which stands for Domestic Violence Reporting and Referral. And it's in all of our emergency rooms in the county of Alameda. We're well, we'd love to have it in Santa Clara as well. Uh, and we make it available to any, any uh, hospital or emergency room that would like to be able to use this great technology. So when a victim of domestic violence comes into the emergency room for treatment, the healthcare provider can follow the, uh, the roadmap, if you will, in the medical record. It lays out exactly what the exam, what they should be asking. What many providers don't do is ask about choking or strangulation. Uh, and so, and also in this medical record and medical uh, tool where the medical provider is documenting injury and documenting what the victim said is a risk assessment tool, both for lethality and a risk of further uh, future harm. Those are the, the people who have come into our hospitals since COVID has come into our lives and the shelter in place has occurred, has gone down. But we're still getting, they're still going into the hospital. So this is another way in which we are able to, once the victim of the domestic violence at the hospital consents to the healthcare provider, the record will come to us. Not their full medical record, but the record of that they were who they are and how we can reach them. And then we're able to follow up with them to see what we can do to help them. Lastly, uh, we're working with the California grocers and the California Grocers Association has agreed to post our posters with our resource numbers for domestic violence and for child abuse, because I, we can't forget that child abuse, children that are being abused in their home are also isolated. They don't have a teacher who can look at them and see their affect or look at them and see bruises or injury. There is not, as the assembly, uh, councilwoman said, there's no trusted adult to tell something's happening to me. So we've created a template uh, poster that DAs across the state are using. And it just puts in the resource numbers for our particular county. We, the, uh, the California grocers have sent it to each of their member grocery stores and are putting them up. The posters are put up in grocery stores because people are still going to grocery stores. And that's a place where they can see if you're a neighbor or if it's a victim herself, or himself, that they can see where's the, ref where's the resource, who can I call, and how can I make that call, including text messaging, as a council member said. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna to touch on scams that we're seeing here in Alameda County, and I, I'm sure Chief Peterson will also add more to this. But some of the scams that we have are uh, people calling, uh, saying, telling someone on the phone, the victim, that they have the ability to help facilitate getting their stimulus check. And they're asking for their personal information, claiming that they're going to be an advocate for them at the federal level to get that stimulus check to them faster. So the one, what we tell all of our constituents, everybody, never, ever, ever give your personal information over the phone to someone. If it's a real government agency, they're not going to ask you for personal information. And the stimulus checks are coming from the federal government. 
they'll come to people's uh, addresses. So there's that. We're also seeing scams where people are calling and saying, you know, grandma, I'm in the hospital. I got tested positive and now they want me to pay for the bill and I don't have any money. Can you please send me some money? Of course, if a grandparent thinks that's their grandchild, they're going to do everything they can to help. But these are scams. And, uh, and so we're very, very um, aware of their certain scams that are popping up. The last one we've seen, two things. One is people are going door to door and they're offering to do COVID testing for $150. And they're saying that they will have the results back within 24 hours. And people who are, who are worried, of course, or concerned about their own health may be taking, taking the opportunity, which is just a fraud, and paying these people to do a test, which really there's no there there. They, they're, they're fake, they're lying, there's no testing, and they're definitely not people that are representing the CDC or the public health department. So we warn everybody that if someone comes to your door pretending to be a healthcare provider from the CDC or from public health, ask for identification, but never give any information out to them. Um, and then, uh, everybody's looking for face coverings and masks, and there's a lot on the internet selling these. A lot of these are just scams. So people are giving their credit card information through Facebook or through other, uh, other online advertisement to get these cool masks or to just get masks or face coverings. And we're really telling people that, remember, when, you pay, when, you put your, when you're buying online, that the, the trusted agencies will have either a little lock at the bottom of the screen, or they'll have something, a check mark that says that they have been vetted and they're a secure agency that can take your credit card information and protect it. But we're seeing a lot of this kind of scams of people trying to get the wipes and trying to get masks and trying to get all the, all the things to help keep them safe from very untrustworthy uh, sources. So that's, that's what we're seeing. And I, an assembly member and councilwoman Thank you for the opportunity because we're all committed. We're in this together and we will get through it together. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much for your presentation and your proactive approach to uh, uh, many of our uh, problems here. And I just wanted to add that uh, although our hospital systems are overwhelmed by the COVID-19 uh, uh, cases, but if you have a, a, a medical emergency, you need to call 911. There's still capacity there to really handle to, uh, a lot of uh, 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 other type of uh, medical emergencies. So uh, next, we'd like to have uh, uh, the uh, district attorney, Jeff Rosen. Jeff, are you on? Yes, I am. Are you, uh, yes, hey, are you Jeff? Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Assembly Member. Thank you so much for having me, Council Member. Uh, I think, as we all know, this pandemic has it's disrupted our lives, our jobs, our families, our plans. And I think the most important thing that I can tell the viewers uh, is what has not been disrupted, what has not been broken, and what has not changed. Uh, COVID-19 has not prevented my office or law enforcement from keeping our community safe and we're gonna to continue to do that. Uh, I think I would just start by just saying a word about how our office and the DA's office has evolved during this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, fortuitously or fortunately for the last several years, we've strengthened our computer and information technology systems to operate electronically and without paper. And this has enabled us to do more and more of our work outside the four walls of the buildings that comprise the DA's office. And then about three years ago, uh, the power went out in our main office where about 80% of our staff is housed. Uh, and then that meant we had to notify 640 employees, prosecutors, investigators, criminalists, support staff of how we would operate and where we would operate before we could move back into our main office. And so for the next week, we set up quarters in our crime lab uh, and then when we were able to move back into our office, we did an action plan as to what we could do better, more efficiently, more quickly, the next time our operations were disrupted. 
And frankly, I thought our operations would, having grown up in California, I thought it would most likely be an earthquake or a fire that would disrupt our operations. Uh, and of course, in this case, it was uh, this terrible virus. Uh, and so that experience of a few years ago uh, allowed us when we got the order from public health to pair back to only um, minimum levels of staffing, really within a matter of a few hours, we were able to contact everyone in our office, outfit people with laptops from which they could work remotely at home uh, and continue to, to do our job and either appear in court remotely uh, or do other things we have to do. So uh, I thought one thing I would talk about is our compliance efforts uh, around the public health order that's been instituted in our county and, across, and all across the Bay Area. Uh, the sh that's the shelter in place order, uh, the closing of all non-essential businesses. Uh, so very quickly when that order went into effect about six weeks ago, uh, the Emergency Operations Center in our county was overwhelmed with phone calls and emails from people saying, I don't, I don't think those individuals are social distancing or that business is open and I don't think it should be open. And so uh, we then uh, brought in a team of our community prosecutors and some of our investigators and support staff to field all of those emails and telephone calls. And over the last five weeks, we've received more than 5,400 emails and phone calls about businesses that are open that perhaps shouldn't be open or uh, individuals that are, are congregating in violation of shelter in place. Uh, the reason it was so important, I think, for us to, to triage all of these calls was to flatten the law enforcement curve. So we've talked a lot in a public health context of flattening the curve around COVID infections and making sure we have the hospital resources to handle the influx of patients. Well, similarly, we didn't want law enforcement to be overwhelmed with 5,400 phone calls that they would have to respond to and they would have to go out and investigate. And so what this enabled us to do was to preserve the scarce law enforcement resources that we have in our county and that we have in, in, in all of our areas to preserve those for, for 911 calls and violence and things that the officers needed to respond to uh, immediately. Uh, what I can say in terms of compliance efforts for our county is that the overwhelming majority of our residents and businesses are voluntarily complying. Uh, for the small number who have not been complying, uh, a phone call from a deputy DA or from a DA investigator generally did the trick. If that didn't work, maybe an investigator would go and visit the business, uh, or perhaps we would talk to our law enforcement partners in that particular city. They would visit the business. That took care of almost all of the problems. There's about maybe a handful of businesses and individuals uh, that ultimately needed to be cited by the police. And we're in the process of reviewing those, uh, those citations to figure out whether to file any misdemeanor charges. But I would just say in a county of 2 million people over a six week period to really just have a handful of citations is a testament to the strength of our community. Um, and our philosophy here was, look, the pe these are not, for the most part criminals, these are just people that wanna live their lives and run their businesses. And so we really made every effort to bring people into compliance voluntarily. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of reporting about jail population and what's happening with jail populations. Uh, in our county, working very collaboratively with our, with our sheriff's department and our court, we've been able to, I think, safely reduce our jail population from around 3,300 before COVID hit to around 2,200 today. Now that's not without some level of risk. I don't think any of the, the chiefs on this call or DA O'Malley uh, are, are entirely comfortable with the people that we needed to release in order to prevent a public health crisis in the jail, but we're, we're cautiously optimistic that by being careful and thoughtful about who was released and how they were released will minimize the chances for recidivism or, or significant criminal uh, activity. So at this point in our jail, we're, we're at a level where the jail can handle a COVID outbreak if there is one and there has not been. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that things will remain uh, good in terms of the jail and in terms of crime overall.
Uh, I would just say a couple words about crime overall. Property crime, uh, burglaries, auto, residential burglaries, auto burglaries have been down over the last six weeks compared to last year. Uh, DUIs have been up significantly. Uh, I think that's there's there aren't as many cars on the road and CHP is able to, to focus on the folks that are out there driving. And, and another thing that's really concerning to me is there's been a significant increase in the number of individuals that have been cited for driving more than 100 miles per hour. That's more than double during this period. So we're, we're concerned about that. Uh, I think that I, I would certainly echo what D. O. O'Malley said in terms of the scams that we're seeing in our county, a number of scams of of, uh, of uh, fraudsters calling people and offering assistance to get the stimulus check from the federal government. Federal government's gonna send you the stimulus check. You don't need any, any help with that. And we have an online, our consumer protection unit has an online presence on our website, on our Facebook page, in where people can submit forms online as it relates to, to scams. And that's available in English, Spanish, or Vietnamese. Uh, I think something else that people are concerned with during this time is price gouging. And there's a number of complaints we have received about price gouging. It's something that we look at and investigate. We've worked with other DA's offices and with the California Attorney General's office around this issue. And certainly online, there's a, there's a great concern that we have in terms of price gouging. In terms of the, the brick and mortar retailers, we've seen, we really haven't seen price gouging that's happened at that level at this point. Um, I think that, that along with Councilmember Orozco and DA O'Malley, we're very concerned about sexual assault and domestic violence. And while we've seen property crimes have gone down, uh, domestic violence has remained uh, the same in terms of the reporting. So it's really stood out to us. And we know that this is a crime that, that is often underreported along with sexual assault. And given the shelter in place, orders that many of our victims are in, it's become even more difficult to report. And so I, I think that DA O'Malley's effort with the California Grocers Association is, a, is an excellent way to try to reach people or reach friends of people to encourage them to report. Uh, in terms of hate crimes, it's something that several weeks ago we started to hear from our uh, API community in Santa Clara County, which is the largest community in our, in our county. It makes up about 35% of our county. We started to hear reports of hate incidents and hate speech. And uh, we, we also really have no tolerance for that in our county. We're a very diverse county. And so one of the things that we did was do a public service announcement, about 55 second long video that uh, we're very fortunate that it got a lot of play in the Washington Post. It was was played on local television several times and more than 10,000 people have viewed it on YouTube. But it really, it starts out very powerfully with one of our Chinese American prosecutors, Charlotte Chang, who supervises actually uh, our uh, major frauds unit uh, saying, this is not a Chinese virus. And I think that that's a message that really resonated with all of our community. And the point that we made there is uh, you know, when you attack someone because of their race or ethnicity or national origin, that's really an attack against all of us in our community. So we, we did this PSA to try to empower victims to report because we know this is a very underreported crime uh, and also to try to deter would-be perpetrators that there will be consequences and we will aggressively prosecute these crimes. And then perhaps most importantly, to remind our community of our shared values of fairness and respect and equal treatment for everyone. Uh, we've filed one hate crime case already, a misdemeanor hate crime for uh, a Vietnamese couple that was threatened in San Jose. Uh, that case is being uh, prosecuted currently. Uh, in order to try to uh, encourage sexual assault and domestic violence victims to come forward, uh, we're gonna be putting out a public service announcement with our, our partners at San Jose PD in the next few days. And we hope that's something that will uh, encourage victims to report. Uh, our family justice centers, two of the three are open in our county, uh, in San Jose and in the south part of our county. And our victim services at the DA's office is open. Our lobby is open. We're responding to phone calls. We're responding to in-person visits, to emails. 
And what we've seen is a great demand for, for food, for money for food for victims, uh, for shelter, for counseling services, and we're still uh, providing those. So that's really what we're seeing in our county. And I just wanna uh, close by emphasizing that we were very well prepared for a crisis uh, in terms of being able to very quickly operate remotely. Uh, and we're, we're able to do our work, whether we're in court or in our office or at home, we continue to do everything we can to protect our community and, and to watch over our residents. And it's really a, a pleasure to be on this uh, town, town hall uh, information program with all of you. So thank you, Councilman, Council Member, and thank you, Assembly Member. Reducing some of the burdens from our public safety office in terms of enforcing this uh, shelter in place uh, uh, ordinance. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the public for really, really doing a great job of keeping the social distance and, and shelter in place. I mean, you pretty much redrawn the line in terms of the number of uh, uh, hospitalizations and hospital uh, people that actually pass away because of this uh, contagious virus. You know, there's a, a stat statistic to say that, you know, your work, you know, uh, for keeping a social distance and shelter at home saves at least 30 to 40,000 of life. So I want to also take this opportunity to thank the public for uh, following this order. And uh, I know that uh, Jeff has another uh, an, uh, important engagement, and uh, uh, your uh, uh, Boyaski will be here to answer any questions. So we'll move on to the uh, next speaker, which is the under sheriff uh, Rick Song, representing the uh, sheriff uh, uh, to, from Santa Clara County, Laurie Smith. And uh, Rick, you're on. Thank you very much, Assembly Member. I really appreciate you uh, for calling this town hall meeting. And Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, of course, it's been a while for uh, co hosting. Uh, as we all know, how critical uh, to, is to address uh, these issues uh, during this time of crisis. So, for the next few minutes, I would like to share the numbers on some of the calls for service in the Sheriff's Office jurisdiction, of course. Uh, DA Rosen, uh, Mr. DA uh, had covered the statistics for the whole county, which will probably be the true reflection of what's going on countywide. But the statistics that I'm going to provide, of course, covers our jurisdiction, which is the cities of Cupertino, Saratoga, Los Altos Hills, as well as the unincorporated pockets throughout the county. Uh, and also the climate of the community and our response uh, related to shelter in place order and of course our office's ongoing efforts to uh, prevent uh, the spread of COVID. So let's start with hate crime. Uh, while many of our residents are, are worried about the hate crime taking place uh, throughout the nation, uh, I am, and I think the DA uh, Rosen had mentioned this also, uh, pleased to report that really no crime has uh, been reported in our jurisdiction, in the sheriff's jurisdiction, uh, which covers those aforementioned areas. Um, and throughout the county uh, in our jurisdiction. And I can say that our residents are uh, fortunate to live in a such a diverse community where most residents, might not be all, but most residents respect other cultures. We did, however, uh, hear about a couple of hate incidents in which verbal insults took place uh, based on our residents' origin. Uh, just to have a better understanding, of course, for those, uh, those folks that are uh, listening in, uh, hate incidents is an action or behavior motivated by hate but not a crime. Uh, when such an action or behavior starts to threaten a person or property, then it may become a hate crime. Our advice, if you uh, feel that you're being a victim of hate incident or hate crime, uh, don't try to take the matter into your own hands. Uh, just call 911 and have law enforcement officers respond uh, to handle the situation. And uh, I agree with uh, both DAs. Uh, there's simply no room uh, for a hate incident or hate crime in our community. So just wanted to, to, to throw that out there. Uh, stats and domestic violence and family disturbance calls. Uh, in our jurisdiction, uh, between March 16, uh, when the shelter in place order went into effect, 
and April 16th of 2020 compare to the same time frame in 2019, uh, domestic violence related calls for service went up slightly uh, by approximately 10% and family disturbance related calls uh, increased uh, by close to uh, say about 35%. Uh, however, due to the lack of data, uh, we're, it's kind of difficult for me to attribute uh, these increases to the shelter in, in uh, uh, place order. Stats on commercial and residential burglaries. During the aforementioned time frame, commercial burglary rate nearly doubled. Uh, but again, uh, since most folks are staying home, so residential burglary rate went down by more than half. Our advice to the business owners who have closed their shops uh, due to COVID um, is to probably beef up security. Uh, maybe it's a great time to uh, install a, uh, an alarm system if you don't already have one. On our office is a response to shelter in place order. As far as the enforcement of the order, our office implemented a first education then citation approach uh, as most residents really aren't fully aware of the restrictions under the order. Uh, since the order went into effect, our office issued only one citation for the violation. Uh, many calls we received, uh, both uh, referred by the DA's office and directly by the, um, the uh, complainants, um, were found to be uh, essential or we did not get subsequent uh, calls out to the same locations or to the same folks. And uh, many folks, you know, pretty much got the, the uh, idea after our first initial response, like the DA uh, Rosen said. Uh, but of course, uh, there has to be something positive in these times of crisis, right? So uh, for those families in our jurisdiction who wish to celebrate birthday, uh, but couldn't get together due to shelter in place order, our deputies have been very happily and diligently uh, relay, relaying those messages and delivering gifts and singing happy birthday to their loved ones, of course, while maintaining social distance. So please contact your local sheriff stations for more details if you live in our jurisdiction, of course. Now, our office's efforts to stop the spread of COVID since the discovery of the first COVID-19 positive case within the sheriff's office, within our office, we stood up the incident command center to quickly respond to issues related to COVID. Within the Incident Command Center, we also created the COVID Investigations Unit that has been primarily responsible for conducting uh, contact tracing on our employees and on uh, those inmates that uh, came into our uh, uh, custody who have tested positive. Those who have been considered exposed or potentially exposed were quickly identified by the COVID Investigations Unit were promptly notified and given instruction to take proper action to prevent the spread further. In addition, any inmate who comes into our uh, facility is now mandated to, uh, to be quarantined for 14 days, unless of course they're released, released sooner than two weeks. Our office also stood up the COVID decontamination unit that provides services to all of law enforcement officers, first responders and medical and health professionals in our county who are exposed to COVID. The unit also decontaminates their vehicles and equipment as well. Uh, we're trying to maintain our health so we can continuously provide service to our residents and of course not get them sick. Uh, regarding the jail releases released to COVID, um, DA Rosen pretty much cover everything so I will rest my case. Uh, and this is the end of my report from the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. If you like so, please uh, give my heartfelt uh, appreciation to Sheriff Lawrence Smith and also the rank and file of the uh, public safety officers that are really on the, on the front line. Uh, the PPE, uh, you, you guys are uh, uh, have sufficient PPE to protect yourself? Well, it's all, uh, thank you so much for uh, doing the huge uh, um, a donation event over at VMC uh, Assembly Member Chu. Yes, we have we have plenty for now, but of course we could always use more. So uh, yeah, if you can reach out to your own respective community once again, we will greatly appreciate that. And DA okay. Rosen will be more than happy to some, share some of those too with you if you guys need. Right. It. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I know you have to leave early and uh, Boyaski, Boyaski be able to answer any questions that we have uh, toward the uh, Santa Clara County Sheriff and the District Attorney's Office. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Next, sir, we'd like to uh, uh, invite the Chief of Police, Kim Peterson from Fremont to uh, join us. I want to thank the uh, uh, Chief for working with my office really very closely and uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, many of uh, public safety related bills. So thank you very much. The stage is yours. Oh, thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this from both you, Assembly Member Chu, and Council Member Carrasco. Um, I can't take credit for those bills. Those are very much your idea. Thank you for uh, for giving us some credit. We have worked closely with you and we appreciate your support of law enforcement. Um, I thought what I would do is give you an overview of some of our crime trends that we're seeing here in Fremont, and then I'll talk a little bit about our experience with the shelter in place. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is going to be a small sample size that I'm talking about. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, what we were seeing in our statistics over the first month of the shelter in place. So uh, basically from the day the shelter in place started here uh, through the following four weeks. Now our overall report volume and our crime volume definitely has gone down significantly in the realm of about 20%. But we are seeing some definite uh, spikes in property crimes, uh, particularly in auto theft, which is up from about 1.8 a day compared to earlier in the year, up to about two and a half per day on average. So that's a pretty significant increase. We're also seeing a, a very large increase in commercial burglaries up from one a day prior to this event to about 1.8 a day. And uh, I think that's the businesses are shuttered and uh, people are taking advantage of that, both in the uh, commercial areas and especially in our schools. So we're working very closely with our schools to uh, try and prevent those. We've made several arrests related to uh, some school burglaries and vandalisms, and um, we're working closely with them to prevent any further issues. Interestingly, uh, very similar to what uh, Under Sheriff Sung was mentioning, our auto burglaries are down. Uh, pretty significantly, and it's the first time in a few years we've seen a decrease in auto burglary. Uh, they are down right now from 6.1 a day prior to the shelter in place down to about 3.7 a day. And residential burglaries have dropped by about a third as well. So those are some good, uh, some good trends for law enforcement and for the people in Fremont. Now, moving on to domestic violence, um, we've seen just a very slight uptick in domestic violence, not st statistically significant, but uh, there is an increase up from about uh, 2.3 a day prior to the event to 2.6 a day. But again, you have to remember that this is a, a, just a snapshot in time, uh, being four weeks. When we compare those numbers to the same time period last year, those numbers are actually down more than 11%. So um, that is what we're doing. So domestic violence uh, definitely has seen a small increase from earlier the, in the year, but a decrease from compared to last year. Now we do partner with SAVE, their uh, domestic violence advocacy group. We have one of their advocates uh, working here in our building. We have access 24 seven to victim support. And as DA, DA O'Malley mentioned uh, before, we've partnered with her uh, in promoting awareness of the hotlines, et cetera. And I really just wanna take a minute to thank DA O'Malley for her leadership in this area, uh, particularly in uh, the area of domestic violence. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Moving on to hate crimes, again, similar to what Under Sheriff Sung was mentioning, um, we have had no reports of hate crimes over the first month of the shelter in place. Now that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Uh, it could mean that uh, people simply are not reporting it, of course. And so uh, we did uh, early in the shelter in place, uh, we did some public service announcements and social media awareness campaigns to make sure people understood uh, that we will not tolerate hate crimes. And uh, we know that they are happening, but it's, it's very possible that people are not reporting them to us. 
Now, there are some other options. If people don't feel like they can report it to the police or they don't feel like it rises a level, to the level of an actual crime, there are hotlines. Uh, DA O'Malley has a, a hotline uh, through her office. There's another hotline that has been promoted quite a bit recently. That one is established by the Asian Pacific Islander Center, and that's intended for hate crimes against the Asian community. And that's important to us in Fremont. Uh, we are a community that's comprised of over 51% uh, Asian uh, population. So we continue to do outreach to our community and urge people, if they have been a victim of either hate crimes or hate speech, to please report those. Now, moving on to the county shelter in place order, we received in the first month of the shelter in place, we received over 800 complaints of violations. We very quickly stood up a compliance team, a, a small compliance team that could do follow up with businesses, et cetera. But our patrol is handling about a quarter of those uh, complaints on shelter in place violations. Now, our approach is really to attempt to gain uh, voluntary compliance. And to that end, we've actually been very successful. We've had to work with uh, businesses of all types, large and small. We have, we have thousands of businesses here in the city of Fremont. And then, of course, it goes right down to the individual who might be violating a shelter-in-place order. But for the most part, people, you know, they really understand the need for this. Maybe it was, uh, maybe they forget, maybe it's inconvenient, maybe they ended up uh, sitting too close to another family uh, at a park and having a picnic and when when they're asked to move for the for the most part they uh, are very willing to comply. We have begun issuing um, some formal warnings for businesses that we have had more than one complaint on or that has been open after the first time we visited and again we so far have been successful in, in gaining compliance. Uh, some of our complaint trends, our, our biggest complaint trends were in the areas of the various parks, one being the Mission Peak uh, access point on Stanford Avenue. Uh, fortunately, we were able to work with East Bay Regional Parks District, and they uh, went ahead and closed it through the end of this shelter in place, or through Mar uh, May 4th at least. And uh, that was significant for our community because that was, um, that was a real pain for the, for the neighborhood that was seeing so much influx uh, for people who still wanted to go hiking from outside the area. We also see uh, some complaints over at our Central Park. Uh, businesses, of course, have some complaints. Um, that's, I'm just giving you some of the trends. And then we are still uh, receiving a few complaints on some churches and places of worship. worship. So we're following up with those uh, locations. And then construction remains um, I think for the most part confusing for many people uh, who may not understand the shelter in place order. And frankly, it can be a little bit confusing for, uh, you know, city officials as well as we have to really look into the details of the order and figure out what type of construction is allowable and what, what type is not. So those are some of the primary trends on the shelter in place. One thing I thought it was important to talk to you about is the recent Judicial Council statewide emergency bail schedule that was enacted back on April 13th. And this is really important for the public to understand. Um, there was 11 separate rules that this Judicial Council made and, and this is, these rules um, apply throughout the state. The Judicial Council is, is um, led by the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court and they came together because they, you know, very well intentioned, wanted to make sure there wasn't any sort of outbreaks in the jails of COVID-19 and they wanted to protect the personnel in their courts as well. So I think uh, these rules were very well intentioned. One of these rules was the enactment of that emergency bail schedule, uh, which has uh, initiated a zero bail system for uh, most misdemeanor crimes with a handful of exceptions and then all low-level felony crimes with the exception of crimes listed as serious or violent and and those are defined in the penal code there's about 13 exceptions uh, on those felony crimes so what that means uh, from the perspective of law enforcement is that when somebody commits a, a felony that would be considered outside of the serious or violent definition so for example a vehicle theft if somebody comes and steals your car, Assemblymember Chu, and we catch them, we have to cite them out. We issue them a ticket. Uh, as long as we can identify who they are, we don't even take them to jail and put them on a temporary timeout. 
And this is important for the public to understand that this was, you know, not the choice of law enforcement, but it's uh, going to be in place until 90 days until the shelter in place is, or I'm sorry, the state of emergency for the state of California is lifted. So it is important for people to understand, you know, they might, we might arrest somebody for uh, commercial burglary. In fact, we had a case just two weeks ago where we arrested a person who broke into a local um, college and they stole thousands of N95 masks and other uh, PPE. We caught them and we had to issue that person a site and just let them walk away from the stop. So it's very frustrating for law enforcement. It's very frustrating for the public to see that. Um, some of the misdemeanor exceptions to that are things like domestic violence or DUI. You know, we still are able to, to um, arrest those people and, and book them into the jails. And I know that uh, Under Sheriff Sung uh, listed out all of the uh, changes that they have made to keep their uh, population safe. And I know that Sheriff Ahern has done the same. So um, one other thing that you may have seen in the news, uh, Alameda County had a, a suspect in their custody who was had been arrested for uh, auto theft. They cited him and then literally 20 minutes later, he uh, violently carjacked somebody about a mile away from the jail where he was released and then drove to San Ramon and tried to carjack another person. So, you know, it, it's really unfortunate result of this uh, zero bail um, rule. So, you know, we just want the public to understand it. Um, our police officers continue to remain at the ready. They are out there for you. We are working very hard. They're working tirelessly, even in the face of this virus, to make sure that our public is safe. Um, but, you know, these rules in particular are out of our hands. So uh, in closing, you know, the Fremont Police Department, we're adapting to our new normal. We're changing our strategies to respond to the changes caused by this, this virus, the changes are around us. We're focusing on high visibility prevention, especially around schools and shuttered businesses, as I mentioned. We're being as responsive as possible to the shelter in place uh, violations and complaints. And, um, Oh, I wa wanted to mention on the scams, DO O'Malley um, mentioned a few of those. A couple others that we're seeing are alerts that come on your cell phone or in your email that you might have been exposed by someone you know. And it's one of those things where they're asking you to give you or give them your personal information so that they can, you know, help keep you safe. Don't trust these things. You don't, don't give people your personal information. We're also seeing fake cures. Uh, we're seeing uh, fake testing kits that are being sent to, or you know, supposedly being av uh, available in your homes. Those are not real. Dig a little bit deeper. You really need to be going through, you know, a, a vetted healthcare system to be to be gaining access to to true tests. And there are no cures, as far as we know, including bleach. Please don't inject bleach into your body. Um, so I think those are the, the primary things that we are seeing in terms of scams. And with that, I just want to thank you again and let you know that, that the police officers are out there ready to protect all of you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chief. How, how was your uh, PPE supply? I, I can't hear you. It's, yeah, could, could, yeah, I know. We, we, I keep trying to unmute, and then, then the oh, okay. uh, is, is muting me again. <laughs> We're fighting there. So RPP's uh, e-supply is, is very good. Uh, the community has been really generous, really helpful. Um, we've had to turn away. Uh, people are, are giving us food. We, we, are, we, we are grateful for that gesture. We are not accepting food at this time. Please give it to the folks who, who truly are in need of that. We know there are many seniors out there who need food. We know there are uh, homeless who need food. Um, we are accepting uh, some limited PPE, but for the most part, we are really set and, and we're right. really grateful to the community for stepping up and helping. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, again, you know, please give my appreciation to the rank and file. Thank you very much for your uh, clarification about this uh, zero bell uh, uh, issue. But those criminals, are they facing any consequences after this emergency uh, ordinance has lifted or they were just? Yes, that, that, that certainly is the hope. I, the, I would say that, you know, I know I 
I would let uh, DA O'Malley uh, speak to it herself, but I'm confident uh, they will be prosecuting these things. Uh, my biggest concern is there's going to be a big backlog at that point. Um, but yes, it is. Uh, the, the intent is that they will be prosecuted after the fact. Yes. Great. Well, this is uh, for for um, Chief Patterson as well as the, the other speakers. Any safety tips that you can offer to to us? Well, I, I'm not so sure that I can offer anything above. Um, you know, take reasonable precautions. We need people to to listen to the medical professionals to take reasonable precautions. Don't take chances. We have seen uh, young, healthy people get sick and die. Uh, we know that there's no cure uh, yet available. There may never be. And um, so it's important to take this seriously. Um, and let's you know, be kind to one another in this time. We're all living a new normal and let's be compassionate to one another. Um, if you see somebody violating the shelter in place order, uh, please don't confront them. There's, there's no need to get into a confrontation. Um, you know, there's, uh, every city has a method uh, whereby you can, can talk to the police or make a complaint, um, but keep yourself safe and um, do your best to, along with all the rest of us to get through this. Thank you. Be kind to one another. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Patterson. And next we'll have, uh, what do we have? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, the, we'll have uh, the ch uh, Chief from Santa Clara County, Pat Nicola. Pat, are you Thank there? Thank you, member. All right. Congre Okay, thank you so much for uh, having me on here and thanks for all, uh, all the technical staff that's helping putting this together too. Uh, specifically for hate crimes, luckily here in Santa Clara, we have not had any, um, but I know that sometimes it's a difficult uh, crime for people to report. Either they have a distrust of law enforcement because of prior contacts or of a cultural basis. So we're gonna be reaching out uh, on our social media platforms to encourage anyone who thinks they are a victim to contact us and, and make a report. Um, and I'm, I'm new to social media. I'm just getting up to speed. I just created my first Twitter account. I have a whopping two followers. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to get the message out uh, through that. Um, in regards to domestic violence calls, now we have seen a, a dramatic increase in domestic violence calls. Uh, overall, our calls for service are down but when you compare um, last year to this year, we've had nearly 100% increase this month in domestic violence calls. And the other problem that we're seeing is that they are more violent and we see a lot more significant injuries. And it seems that the stressors of the, the shelter in place are really beginning to manifest themselves um, physically. Now we have a pro arrest policy and we, you know, we have numerous resources available to victims. And we, we encourage people to report um, suspected domestic violence. Um, you know, people are calling about social distancing violations, you know, people standing too close. Well, if they're willing to do that, I hope they'd be willing to report when someone is being uh, victimized um, at home. Uh, regarding property crimes, we have started to see an increase. Again, it's commercial um, burglaries. And uh, I don't know why, but catalytic theft converters are, um, uh, catalytic converter thefts have st are started up again. So if you have a Toyota Prius, please park it in the garage. Um, I don't know why, but that's really jumped up. So what we are doing is we're using our crime analyst to help track the uh, locations so that we can put our patrol officers out to try to, try to um, catch these people. Another thing we've seen in Santa Clara is an increase in street racing. Now that the roadways are clear, um, especially in our commercial areas, we've got a lot of street racers out. And we haven't seen the sideshows yet, but we're worried that that's the next step. So actually pre-pandemic, Santa Clara created a new um, city ordinance so that we could cite um, spectators at these kind of events. So that's gonna be another tool that we have. Um, internally, we've been very fortunate. We've only had one uh, officer contract COVID, and so that's that's great news for us. Um, he actually was very sick, and he just recently got cleared for light duty, so we're very happy about that. 
Um, but we have a six person unit now that is doing nothing but uh, COVID uh, related details, uh, collecting PPE. I know that was a concern. We, we've gotten a lot of PPE. We've gotten a lot of donations from our community. So that's great to see. Um, and we're also working on decam decontamination processes. So I really want to thank the sheriff's office. They set up an incredible decontamination facility. We use that as a model and we're going to be able to set one of those up for our, our own department. So that's going to be very helpful for us. Now about the shelter in place order, Santa Clara has had a great opportunity, a great response. We haven't had any citations issued. Everybody's had voluntary compliance. And I, again, I'd really like to thank the DA's office for triaging those calls because I know there's many, many calls that come in that we don't have to worry about. And so uh, we're, we're very thankful for that. And like everyone else, we're waiting to see what happens in May. Are the orders lifted? Are they, are they gonna change? Um, everything I've read says this is gonna be a long-term problem. It could be many months or years before things you know, change. And so for Santa Clara, a couple of unique things are Levi Stadium. When is the NFL going to start up again? And if it does start up again, are we going to have fans there? We also have Great America, the theme park. Is that going to be open for business? Now, these kind of venues, um, they bring people in from, you know, not only out of, out of the area, but from out of state and out of the country. So our concern, obviously, is will that, you know, make us a hot spot? Will we we'll have a resurgence in the virus? Um, the bottom line is, is that Santa Clara is doing what we've always done. We provide full service to our community, you know, regardless of what the health orders are. And I think when we're through all this, you know, our department's going to be stronger and our relationship with our community is going to be even better. So thank you very much for hosting this. And uh, I look forward to, to working with you. Definitely. Well, congratulations again for your recent election and my uh, prayers and best wishes to the, the uh, PD that, contracted the disease. I'm, I'm glad to know that he's recovering well. Um, are you taking over the uh, the convention center, the security of the convention center of the makeshift uh, hospital? So that's that's been a very interesting situation. And right now the state is going to be in charge of it. Um, they have private security there. And luckily it hasn't been able, it hasn't had to have been used uh, very much. So there's between seven to 10 people and it, like it, it's set up for 250 people. So there's plenty of room to spread out. So luckily we haven't had any calls for service there. All right. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. And next we'd like to uh, ask, uh, oh, this is my captain from Valarla, the Foothill Division, Jason Talk. Jason, I see Jason in so many community meetings and I'm so glad that he'd be able to join us on this uh, virtual town hall. Are you there, Jason? I'm here, assembly member. All right. How are you? Oh, I'm very good. So on behalf of Chief Garcia, thank you so much for allowing San Jose PD to participate in this uh, virtual meeting. So I just want to also thank Council Member uh, Carrasco for her leadership in this very, very um, unprecedented times. So I'll, I'll try to make it brief. I, a lot of this is going to be a little bit redundant with some of the other uh, police agencies. So internally, uh, San Jose PD has experienced uh, some COVID cases ourselves. We've had uh, five um, employees infected by this virus, uh, four sworn and uh, one civilian staff. So fortunately, with a very quick response by our leadership, uh, Chief Garcia and, and my immediate uh, Supervisor Chief Tyndall, they stood up our police command center. Uh, they constructed a covert, uh, COVID response team to just make sure all of our staff is really aware of what's happening. We were making uh, operational changes almost uh, every few hours just to ensure that we were doing everything possible to keep our staff as well as the community that we would interact with as safe as possible from infection. Some of the things that we did, uh, just operational changes, uh, temporarily at least, just to reduce the infection, did affect some of the, the call volumes and, and how we interacted with the community. So for example, we had to temporarily close our main lobby. 
just for walk-in reporting and other administrative uh, tasks where people would come in to, uh, for instance, get their, their car back or pay some sort of administrative fee for a report. So that's been temporarily closed just uh, to reduce spread infection rate. We've expanded our online reporting capacity. Um, that has uh, greatly helped us. We've always had a very good footprint with online reporting, but now with this pandemic, we've expanded that capability. We've uh, also, as we are doing here, we're conducting a lot more virtual meetings. Um, the meetings that uh, you and I have attended uh, now seem to be more frequent with the, the virtual meetings just because they are a little bit more convenient. So my virtual meetings have increased uh, significantly, which, which is good. I, I didn't know how to use Zoom before, so I, I've learned something. Uh, we've changed a couple of um, uh, protocols with death investigations. Historically in the past, uh, our officers responding to a medical case that involves a death investigation made the assumption that maybe something was uh, suspicious, so we would always take a look uh, before uh, medical personnel would. Uh, we had to change that a little bit uh, with the, uh, the virus. Uh, we we want to make sure that our staff is safe also. So uh, medical personnel or fire personnel may go in uh, with full PPEs. They have much better PPE, uh, particularly the, the mask, uh, to go in and safely uh, take a quick look uh, if something appears to be um, suspicious in nature, of course, we, we stop right away, we reset, and uh, we conduct a criminal investigation from that point. Uh, crime trends. So some of the crime trends uh, are very similar to the other cities that we've experienced. Uh, the trends that we are seeing decrease are, our violent crimes have significantly decreased compared to last year. Aggravated assaults, have decreased, robberies as well as gang uh, crimes have decreased during this uh, five week cycle. We are seeing a lot more, uh, I'm sorry, we're seeing a lot less uh, car accidents and we're seeing a lot less residential burglaries. Obviously with less people uh, driving to work and from work, uh, there are not as many uh, accidents uh, because everybody's home uh, during this pandemic. The, their homes are not really getting broken into because they're occupied. What we are seeing a little bit of an increase in, only in the last couple of weeks of the pandemic, has been a slight increase in commercial burglaries uh, in the last couple of weeks. But overall, for the month, it, it has been actually down. And a slight increase in the last couple of weeks for school break-ins. So uh, how we responded to those has been uh, some of our school staff that ordinarily would be assigned to a school liaison or resource position. Those officers were repurposed to, uh, to check on the schools. We have over 225 schools in our city. So with uh, the four or five officers we have cycling through the city, we've trying to spread them around and make sure that we help our partners at the school spot check uh, their locations. We are also asking uh, school officials, if they do have staff that is on payroll, uh, whether they be administrative or janitorial staff, maybe at some point throughout uh, the workday to help us out and uh, be on premise so that way it doesn't look like there's nobody at the school. Uh, with our compliance officers, we, uh, because of some of the declines in other aspects of our uh, crime, we were able to repurpose some officers to do compliance checks. So we are uh, also, as the other agencies, we're trying to get voluntary uh, compliance. Uh, we have issued a few citations for habitual offenders, uh, primarily for non-essential businesses. Uh, to this point, we haven't issued any um, uh, offenses for just private citizens. For the most part, if we uh, respond out to a, a park uh, where kids are skateboarding or young adults are skateboarding or playing basketball, we ask for compliance and they're usually pretty good about it. Moving into uh, domestic violence, uh, we uh, are experiencing a less reporting of domestic violence in the last couple of uh, weeks and overall in the last five weeks, less reporting. But I, I do agree with council member Carrasco that because uh, people are home, we may be experiencing 
um, some some hesitation of of calls. So the reporting uh, seems a little bit um, unusual. So I, I think, uh, as we all know, this is one of the uh, most underreported crimes. So I, I wanted to stress how uh, in San Jose we've been very uh, progressive with how we investigate uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and uh, abuse of children. Uh, we've developed what's called an intersection tool. We've learned over the years that a lot of those crimes uh, over, overlap or they intersect with one another. So uh, our officers are directed to ask very exploratory questions about other uh, types of domestic incidences. So for example, if we respond to a call of a domestic violence, uh, we would then also prod uh, about any type of other violence that could be occurring at the house, whether that be with uh, child abuse or whether that be with some sort of sexual abuse or sexual assault. So we know that um, uh, oftentimes in the past, traditionally, we may come to the same house uh, every uh, maybe month or two for a different type of a crime offense. So we're trying to combine uh, our efforts and, and really uh, provide less trauma to our victims or survivors by just um, obtaining uh, one disclosure, whether it be for several different crime uh, that has occurred several different times. Also, progressively, we are training our officers in a trauma-informed approach when dealing with domestic survivors of uh, domestic violence, sexual assault. Uh, this approach, really, it, in essence, it just changes uh, the police officer's lens. Looking at uh, certain behaviors of victims, we have learned through experience that victims sometimes, uh, they don't remember things uh, clearly or they remember things in different orders. Uh, in the past, law enforcement has looked at some of these behaviors and we become very suspicious that they're, they're based on deception. Uh, we know this is not true with uh, trauma victims. We know that uh, memory is, is greatly affected by trauma and sometimes the uh, defensive mechanisms of victims uh, are interpreted differently when law enforcement becomes involved. So this trauma-informed approach has been rolled out to our detective bureau. Uh, our recruits in the academy are uh, being trained and uh, pretty soon all of our staff will be trained. Hate crimes. Um, for the most part, I, I can agree with Under Sheriff Sung that we are not seeing a huge spike in reported hate crime. Uh, but what I want to stress is that hate incidences that don't rise to the level of uh, what we call a hate crime is just as important to us. So at San Jose PD, we have a hate crime detail that looks at all of the hate incidences as well as the hate crimes. And we take that very seriously. So I, I would encourage anybody in the community that feels that they've been uh, affected by a hate incident or a hate crime to please call uh, 911 and report that. And lastly, um, I'm just going to finish up with some closing remarks in the health order. Uh, we, we're seeing again uh, pretty, pretty good compliance by folks. I just want to use the example of uh, Easter and we knew that it was going to be a very uh, a warm weekend and we were going to get a lot of uh, gatherings. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that we were able to really handle that weekend uh, pretty um, productively and, and positively. Uh, some of the parks were closed because we knew that it would be hard to enforce uh, the, the stay away or um, the social distancing um, ordinance. So some of those parks were closed to make it a little bit easier for law enforcement, specifically San Jose PD to enforce, and that was very effective. Moving into Cinco de Mayo though, I anticipate uh, something of the same phenomenon. We are very prepared for Cinco. We have uh, several different operation plans just to uh, prepare for any uh, increased gathering, increased vehicular cruising, or anything that comes our way. So I just want to uh, just close again with uh, my appreciation for you, Assemblyman, just for setting this up and, and Council Member Carrasco for, for everything you guys do for the community. Thank you. No, uh, thank you. Thank you, Captain Talk.
you got a nice haircut. I need to know where, where, where can I get a you know, haircut. But uh, what, how's your PPE uh, status? Your PPE? We, our PPE are, is very good. Um, I don't know if uh, a few weeks ago, we actually had a surplus that Chief Garcia donated to some healthcare uh, providers. We are uh, looking to uh, conserve as much PPE as we can. If we can reuse it, then we try to reuse uh, some of our PPE. If, if we can't, then um, we, we get a new one. But for right now, we, we're doing very good with PPE. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, please convey my uh, heartfelt appreciation to Chief Garcia and all the rank and files. And uh, I'm wishing those uh, people that got, those PD that got infected by the virus have a speedy recovery. Any of their family members got uh, impacted? Or just, uh, you have the detected early and you quarantine the PD so their family members are not affected? That's correct. It, it just seems right. like it's, it's more isolated to the actual employee and it did not spread to the family members at home, thankfully. Yeah. Well, we talk about some hate crime uh, calls. I wonder, do, we, do you receive a lot of those uh, emotional stress? Was 5051 call? Uh, the 5150 calls, those are, um, those are calls that generally involve people that uh, are a danger to themselves or, or maybe suicidal in, in nature. I know right now, uh, just the community in general, five weeks, uh, a lot of people are, are just, they feel confined and maybe they have a little bit of cabin uh, fever. And so there's a lot of people I, I notice outside trying to maintain their physical fitness. It's, it's very difficult now with uh, the parks being shut down, some of the beaches uh, to, to remain physically fit as well as trying to adhere to the health order uh, suggestions. So we, we, are, we are seeing a little bit of uh, 5150s here and there. Um, I, I don't know if I would um, uh, correlate it to the, the pandemic. Um, a lot of the 5150 type of incidents we respond to are people suffering from some sort of mental illness or maybe some sort of chemical uh, abuse uh, with drugs or alcohol. Great, thank you very much. I know a lot of people are under a lot of stress, you know, financially or mentally. So I'm just con uh, concerned about the increase of 5150 calls, but you haven't really seen the uh, uh, spike. That, no, we haven't that, seen that. We great. haven't seen a spike in those type of incidences. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, and and we'll next we'll have uh, Captain Lowe's from uh, a new work. Uh, uh, police department. Captain? Hi, how are you? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for the invite for this town hall meeting. Uh, I think it's very important for us to get our messages across and also give people the opportunity to hear from us as this is a difficult and challenging time. I'm honored to be here with uh, also my esteemed uh, colleagues, and I also want to thank all the members of the public that have logged in to listen to us. I just want to go over quickly on our crime trend here in the city of Newark. And I'm happy to report that the vast majority of all crime, including violent crime and property crime, has gone down dramatically. Uh, and the only slight uptick that we have is, again, uh, is what other colleagues has already mentioned, is a little bit slight uptick in domestic violence. Uh, and But everything else has gone down. Uh, some has gone down over 50%, and that's including violent crime as well as property crime. I wanna have a special concentration on hate crime, and I think we've seen it all over social media and on the news that it is on the rise, but I do want to report that in the city of Newark, we have zero report of any hate crime uh, since the beginning of this year. So it, we're doing an outstanding job as a community to cherish our diversity uh, and taking care of each other and this have not shown uh, any increase at all whatsoever. And I just want to reinforce that the city of Newark cherish our diversity and will continue to be aggressive in protecting uh, our diversity and continue to encourage people that may have felt threatened or a victim of crime, uh, hate crime, to please continue to call us. And I also just want to note that hate crime, while at a particular point that the Asian community 
is a little bit more susceptible to. I want to encourage everybody that hate crime can affect anybody. So anybody that feel that they are subject of this to please call us. Our officers stand by at the ready. They are trained and they will aggressively uh, investigate this. Um, and I, I do want to touch up on a little change in the police department in that while we change our policing policy a little bit and the procedure of certain calls we go to, uh, as officers are responding to less calls because there are less calls for service, our officers continue to be proactive in other means. And they are proactive by being more visible out on the streets. They are more proactive in going to shopping centers as they are more vacant and things like that. Those are the steps that we're continuing to make uh, to show that, hey, the police is still here and we're still working. Uh, and that this COVID-19 is not gonna stop us from doing our job. I also want to uh, thank Chief Peterson for touching up on the zero bail uh, um, initiative as I think it's important for a member of the public to understand why when a subject is arrested that they get a citation on some cases. And while it may be frustrating uh, to some, I do just want to echo the fact that we will continue to investigate those crimes and continue to be aggressive with them and uh, hold them accountable. Now, I do want to touch on the reporting of health order violation. Uh, and I'm asking that anybody to, that wants to report such violation to email us at planning at newark.org. That's P-A-L-L-I-N-G at newark.org. We're asking you not to call the police department or the dispatcher as we want our dispatchers to be free in handling and taking emergency calls. At this time, we have not issued any citation and we're taking the educational approach. And we feel that that is the way it's going to continue because we are getting very good compliance and we're very happy with the community, um, the, the community acceptance of this. And uh, the more we do this and the more we come together, the sooner this is going to happen. Our, we're also doing pretty well on PPE. Uh, we, we do accept uh, certain things and we have received uh, some of them. And if you do want to donate some, please, uh, you could come to the police department and you could call, uh, contact the watch commander and they will come out and graciously accept most of the things that uh, you donate. Uh, however, we are doing fairly well. Um, our social media uh, engagement manager is doing a great job as pushing out live information and up-to-date information on health order updates and other things like that that is very important and i want to encourage everybody that's listening that's living in the city of newark and maybe the surrounding area to continue to follow us on social media for these updates and you could follow us uh on facebook at uh, our twitter at newark police or our instagram at newark california underscore pd uh, and finally without going into the same thing that my colleagues has gone, I really just want to express our appreciation to the community for really coming together at a time like this. Your compliance is appreciated. Our officers will continue to be there for you and will continue to be aggressive at crime. There is one thing that I do want to maybe say to our community is that this is going to be over. We're going to overcome this and this is, we're going to move on. But with that said, I don't want people to be complacent as to what we're doing now. While crime is at pretty much, in my opinion, all time low in our city, once we get back to normal, once we start leaving the house, going back to work, please don't forget to continue to lock your cars, continue not to leave your package unattended and things like that, because we all know that the criminal elements is there to take advantage of it. So take this time to really hone in on your crime prevention skills that you have right now, being at home, watching out for your neighbors, watching out for each other. And uh, we just want to offer that we empathize with what everybody's going through. It is tough, it is difficult, but we're gonna get through this together. And the Newark Police Department is here for you. So if you need anything, please call us directly at 510-578-4237. Thank you so much. Thank you, Captain Law. Thank you for the positive uh, note as well. And I definitely want to thank you for your service and please convey my uh, uh, heartfelt appreciation to all the rank and files of the police, uh, frontline uh, public safety officers 
and and your work. Thank and you next very much. we'll have uh, Captain from a uh, city of Milpitas, Captain Hernandez. Is Captain there? There we go. I was having some issues there. Oh, hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm glad you can hear me. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Assembly Member Chu and Council Member Carrasco, for providing this platform for us to continue to connect with the public. We think it's very important for people to hear our messages, and uh, this is an excellent way uh, to do that. A couple of the things that I plan on talking about is some of the crime trends that we've seen during COVID-19. I'll provide some safety tips, talk about some local public safety initiatives that we've implemented, and then also how we responded to the public health orders. Um, you know, COVID-19, it literally changed the habits of the general public overnight. And as a result, we immediately saw a drop in criminal activity. And that was really evident in our auto burglary and residential burglary statistics. Um, in fact, during the shelter in place order, we saw a 15% decrease in calls for service and an overall 21% decrease in part one crimes, which is really good. Um, however, just like the general public had to adapt to the new norm, so did the criminals. Um, where we used to see our auto burglary trends occurring daytime in shopping centers, it shifted to nighttime in residentials. Um, and then we also saw an increase in um, businesses being targeted for uh, burglaries because they're unoccupied, and then also an increase in auto theft. Now, it's a little bit misleading when I talk about the next couple of statistics because I'm not talking about a year to date comparison. If you look at a year to date comparison, we're low in all categories. So the period of time that I'm talking about is gonna be the month prior to the shelter in place order and the month during the shelter in place order. Um, for domestic violence, we did see an increase uh, during the shelter in place order of a 30% increase in do domestic violence arrests during the shelter in place. Um, you know, I, that's probably like others have mentioned, um, goes in line with some of the stresses of job security, the economic decline, and some of the other general stressors that come along with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, one of the other things in addition to uh, domestic violence that we were really concerned about um, and has been mentioned before is um, child safety and child abuse investigations, whether it be physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional abuse, because the majority of our reported crimes in that area was a result of teachers being observant and seeing bruises or noticing a behavior that was different in a child or even a disclosure made from the child to the teacher. And with schools not functioning, that outlet for, for those potential victims to um, connect with, with services to help them really isn't there. So one of the things that we continue to do is uh, work with the Milpitas Unified School District. In fact, our Chief of Police, Armando Corpus, He's in regular contact uh, through phone meetings with the superintendent's office and the district has an assigned social worker that stays attentive to um, homes where it's likely an at-risk home or where there's been other incidences uh, in the past. So that's one thing that we, we can continue to do to try to keep uh, children safe. With respect to hate crimes in the API community, um, you know, Milpitas is unique. We have somewhere between a 62 to 65% uh, population of, of Asian. Um, and we haven't had any reported crimes against the uh, Asian Pacific Islander community where it was confirmed that, that hate was the motivation behind the crime. You may have seen on the news recently, and it was mentioned earlier in the uh, webinar, about an incident of vandalism that occurred in the city of Milpitas a couple nights ago. Um, there was a, a couple Asian businesses where um, the windows were smashed. Our detectives, they're investigating those incidences. They're continuing to collaborate with the San Jose Police Department who had some similar incidences. And really what's gonna happen is, is the goal is to identify a suspect and make a determination if, uh, if hate was in fact a motivation for those crimes. Um, but overall, we have no incidences to report um, when it comes to um, hate crimes. With respect to general tips for staying safe, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that even though the public is, is, is bound to their homes that they can do you know, remain vigilant. If you see a motion sensor light go on outside or you hear the dogs barking and it's out of character of their normal behavior, look out the window and report that to the Bonpitas Police Department. We will show up. If there's something that's out of, the, out of the norm, we will be there. That is a promise. Um, you know, make sure that you're taking your valuables out of your car and bringing them into your home. Make sure you secure your cars. Sometimes we, we feel 
um, a little more comfortable about leaving things in our cars or, or potentially leaving our cars unlocked because we feel like it's secure in our driveways or it's, it's on our own turf or whatever you want to call it. But the reality is we're seeing those crimes. We're seeing those happen. So um, make sure you're bringing those things in the house and, and don't allow yourself to be a um, victim. Along the lines of auto theft, sometimes families will keep a spare car key to another car that they own in the glove box or in the center console of the car. And what happens is the criminals may come across that while they're trying to, to do a vehicle burglary and find the key to the car that's next to it in the driveway and then steal the car. So bring those, those keys inside. Don't leave them in your car as, as, a, a, um, as a convenient place in case your, your loved one gets locked out. The other thing that, that I want to talk about is um, those people that park in apartments. You know, with a shelter in place order, people aren't going to the stores very often. Maybe they select a day or two days a week to go, or maybe they don't go for several weeks um, and they have a, a family member picking stuff up for them. And uh, I would urge those folks that live in apartment complexes to check your car daily, see if everything's okay with it. Because one of the things that we rely on in law enforcement is accurate crime data. And we analyze the crime data and it helps us to decide how we're going to deploy. So if you check your car and you can tell us, hey, this happened last night, that's, that's useful information versus it happened sometime over the last two or three weeks. So remain vigilant, keep an eye on your stuff and uh, let us know if something's not right. Um, lastly, uh, one of the places, a few places that people are still going are grocery stores. And so one of the things that I'm concerned about and we're concerned about here at the police department is that the criminal element sees that as an opportunity to conduct purse snatches or conduct other person's crimes um, because it's one of the few places that people still are these days. And, you know, prior to COVID-19, if you saw a person wearing a mask, you're going to call the police. Today, you call the police if the person's not wearing a mask. And so the criminal element could really hide amongst the other people wearing masks and, and not look different. Um, so we urge the public to remain vigilant, stay observant, um, and pay attention to those things. With respect to public safety initiatives, um, here at the police department, we've implemented a number of operational changes. Uh, one of those most evident for those that are wishing to do business with the Milpitas Police Department is that our lobby is closed. If you want to do business with us, there's an online appointment system. So if you want to pick up property or you want... Um, to get a copy of a report. Just go to our website, make an appointment, and, um, and we'll get you taken care of. Um, as a police department, we're continuing to engage with the community through our social media platforms. In fact, Captain Maharaj, who oversees our social media unit, um, he's working on developing messaging for community resources related to domestic violence, hate crimes, different food resources, um, basically the needs that, that people uh, have. In, in these um, unprecedented times. Um, let's see here. Um, other initiatives, uh, these are more citywide initiatives, but citywide, um, the city of Milpitas has implemented food programs, economic development and small business assistance, and also have stepped up digital engagement through our parks and recreation department. And I know that this is about public safety, but I think, and we believe in the city that these are all related to public safety because these initiatives, they promote a better overall health for the city and that has a direct impact on public safety and crime. So we believe it's all important for all different departments in the city. Um, the stay at home order uh, for us, um, it's really been simple. Um, we concentrated on um, educational approach and making sure that people were aware of the order. Our community was very responsive. Uh, we didn't issue a single citation. Um, just in a matter of a few words, we were able to, um, to get people on the same page with us. And that just is a testament to, to the folks in our community here in the city of Milpitas. Um, along the lines, you may have heard, along the lines of the public health order effective today in the city of Milpitas, we're requiring face coverings and essential businesses for the workers and the customers. We're the first in the Santa Clara County to do that. Um, time will tell how, that, how that's received. I believe it will be well received. I don't anticipate that we're going to have much enforcement related to it. I think that the community is going to take a similar approach and, and be respective of those rules. Um, and so we'll be doing a lot of education on that as a police department. Um, the last thing that I really think is important for people to understand is that, you know, 
the Milpitas Police Department, even though COVID-19 is happening, even though uh, people, you're, you're stuck in your homes for the most part, the Milpitas Police Department will continue to be a full service police department. We will continue to maintain our response times of well under three minutes to emergencies. And our officers are gonna remain proactive. They're getting out of their cars, they're on foot, they're checking your businesses if you're a business owner to uh, try to make sure you're not victimized. We're constantly reviewing our crime statistics and we're constantly assessing our deployment to address crimes and safety. So that's pretty much sums it up what's going on here in Milpitas. So much, uh, Captain Hernandez. Thank you for your report and some public safety uh, safety tips. You know, we all rely on our police de department to keep our community safe, but we need to really be their eyes and ears. And so, if you see something, you call the police. You report it. I think that's a, a one a way that we can reduce the crime in our community. And I really appreciate the Milpitas leadership for implementing the, the, the mask ordinance. I am a proponent of the mask. I think it will definitely will reduce the spread of the virus. And the, the reason early on, the, uh, the, 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 even the, the health professional was telling people that, hey, mask uh, doesn't work, keep a social distance. And I believe that is really because of the shortage they don't want the people, you know, go online or go to the store and hoarding and those masks. But uh, um, I do believe that a mask uh, will help. You know, that's why we asking people when you cough, you know, you cough on your elbow. You know, that's that's pretty much the the the, the uh, common sense. So thank you, thank you very much. And again, uh, my uh, heartfelt appreciation for. Uh, uh, kept at the chief corpus and, and all the rank and file of Milpitas uh, Police Department. And before we move on to the uh, question and ask the section, some I know Omali, uh, 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 DA Omali has some video he wanted to share with us. So can we uh, get on to the video? No, yes? Uh, some number, can you hear me? Yeah, well, yeah. We're going we're gonna to start with Santa Clara and then we'll play, we will play um, uh, um, Alameda County. So I'm starting with Santa Clara the studio first. Oh, it doesn't matter. Play it. This is not a Chinese virus. This is not an Italian virus. Viruses do not have ethnicities, religion, sexuality, or gender. But our community does. And if you hurt or threaten someone because of those things, you'll have a lot more to worry about than COVID-19. When you attack a member of our community because of their ethnicity, the color of their skin, or where you think someone is from, then you have attacked us all. Okay, we're moving on to the second one. Yes. Hi, my name is Nancy O'Malley, and I'm the District Attorney of Alameda County. During this period of unprecedented crisis, standing together and supporting each other as a community has never been more important. The sudden increase in hate field speech and criminal acts targeted against members of the Asian community, particularly against the Chinese Americans who live and work in Alameda County, is entirely intolerable. The district attorney's office maintains a hate crime hotline and it's available for the reporting of hate related crimes. That number is 510-208-4824. It has messaging in English, Spanish, Farsi, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Tagalog. I have directed my office to be on heightened alert during this time of crisis. We will be vigilant and swift in our response to reports of hate crimes. And we will protect all members of our community against hate-driven violence. All right, that's the end of the video. My uh, staff found it important to uh, point out the first video was actually from Santa Clara County, uh, Jeff Rosen's office. The second one is from Alameda County. Do we have time for Q&A? 
Do we have a, a yes, question? We, uh, Yes, we have some questions. So this is Simone. I'm going to read the questions as they are submitted. We will do our best to go through as many questions as possible. However, if you don't get to your questions today, feel free to reach out to our office. So the first question is from Jeff S. Uh, for both district attorneys. What do district attorneys think about the zero bail policy that's letting repeat offenders back on the streets? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's the order of the Chief Justice. And I have very very high regard and respect for her judgment and her uh, response to this horrific uh, virus. It is uncomfortable, as Chief Peterson talked about, to have somebody break into a car, steal a car, and then get it released immediately. Uh, the, the person can be booked, into, into, booked in to a jail and then released, or released and cited as the chief indicated. The one thing that makes me less uncomfortable is that if there's somebody who uh, has a horrific background or somebody that has, uh, has done more than simply the, the basic crime, that the police department uh, has the opportunity to contact a duty judge to show why that particular defendant or particular person they're arresting should have a higher bail or who should have bail set. And I'll give you some examples that uh, the list of serious and violent felonies does not include the crime of human trafficking of children. So if somebody is arrested for trafficking, sex trafficking a minor, that they would technically be entitled to that zero bail. Of course, uh, that doesn't make sense to me and I don't think to my law enforcement colleagues. And so we, we urge our law enforcement partners and if the case ends up in court, then we will advocate for that person to have bail set. The courts, the judges still retain their authority under the California Constitution to set whatever bail they deem is necessary for the protection of the public or to ensure that that person will return. So with that, with that uh, exception to the zero bail, um, you know, I think that it's a, it is a balance between trying to make sure that there's enough uh, room in a an incarceration facility to uh, keep people safe that are inside, especially if they're going to be getting out. We want them to be healthy when they walk out the door also. Uh, and also um, to be able to ask for higher bail or ask for bail to be set if, it's, if the particular case or the particular individual warrants it. Jeff, uh, I would uh, join in what DA O'Malley has said and I would answer your question as follows. Uh, we don't like the zero bail ruling that the Chief Justice set. But I'll, and what I'll tell you, what, what would be far worse than a number of people being let out on zero bail and not being detained appropriately, what would be much worse than that would be if the jail in Santa Clara County turned into uh, the prison that exists in Marion, Ohio where they have a thousand inmates who have COVID-19. And it wouldn't just be, and I'm not saying because it would be bad for those thousand inmates. I'm saying it would be bad because this virus respects no walls, no borders, and it would spread throughout our entire community uh, at a far greater rate than we're currently seeing. So that's why the Chief Justice came out with the statewide zero bail conditions. Um, I guess I could also add that Santa Clara County is blessed to have an independent pretrial services department so that for a long time we've been working to make sure appropriate people are detained and people who can be safely released are released. The order from the Chief Justice was sort of a one size fits all for all of 50, all 58 of California's counties. But Santa Clara County, I think was well positioned to deal with this because we were able to uh, work with our pretrial services department. So I hope that answers your question, Jeff S. All right, thank you for the question. I know it's probably not a very easy decision for the chief justice as well. Moving on to the second question. Okay, so the second question is for the Santa Clara Police Department from Paul. Um, how 
use a CPD in the city planning to increase department staffing, especially in the field, as more and more housing and commercial office space is being built in the city. The new developments throughout the city are certainly going to raise the city's daytime and nighttime population. And with those increases, we're certain to see increased calls for service from the PD. Nikolai. Pat on the line? Yeah, sorry, I had technical, little de technical difficulties. It, it didn't come through. What was the, could you repeat the question? Yes, so um, how is SCPD and the city planning to increase department staffing, especially in the field, as more and more housing and commercial office space is being built in the city? The new developments throughout the city are certainly going to raise the city's daytime and nighttime population. And with those increases, we're starting to see increased calls for service. Yeah, no, when, when I first started uh, getting into this position, I had several conversations with the city manager about increasing the size of our department for those very reasons. Um, unfortunately, with the COVID, um, the budget is gonna be probably the biggest factor affecting our, our ability to increase the size of our department. Um, luckily, the city has a significant reserve, a nice rainy day fund, but I think we can all agree that it's flooding right now, and I don't know that it's going to be enough. So uh, while I agree with you that we do need to increase the size of our department and we need to have more officers, realistically, and until we get this... Um, financially into a place where we can grow, I think we're gonna to have to just, you know, do more with less, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. So thank the, you uh, we So that was, that's, this is all the time we have for questions today. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions, um, the ones that you have sent in, staff will follow up on those. Great, thank, thank you very much and uh, and I just wanted to close that our office has put out some resources for uh, COVID-19 resources. And I uh, encourage you to get online to check on it you know, regarding to unemployment and uh, 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 state, county, uh, uh, regard the resources. Um, just quickly wanted to also mention that um, I think next Tuesday, the uh, gig workers and a self-employee, you know, 1099 employee can also uh, get uh, unemployment uh, uh, payment. So I encourage you to uh, uh, apply uh, after the next Tuesday. I know there's a long, frustrating wait, but uh, we'll, we'll get to you and definitely we'll uh, pay you retrofitly. So with that, I, uh, Councilmember Carrasco, you have any final closing comment? Oh, yes. Uh, well, you know, I um, I just want to thank you again, Councilmember, and I want to thank everybody who who's left here on the panel. And I know that some folks have already uh, had to jump off. Uh, you know, this uh, this is a, a new way of doing business, but it's I I find it actually to be refreshing because it gives us an opportunity to be able to connect from all corners of, of uh, the county and, uh, and be able to, to really exchange information and, and cross-pollinate in terms of the kinds of ideas and the kind, uh, and the kind of work that everybody is doing. I, I really want to extend a, a heartfelt gratitude to everybody that's doing the kind of work that you're doing to keep our community safe especially those who are in such vulnerable positions. And of course, that's, that's what you do. You keep us all safe. But, you know, we, we have women and children who very often don't have voices to express uh, their, their anxieties, their stress, their, the, the risk that they're under. You are proactively going out there and making sure that they're safe. Uh, quite often, uh, uh, saving their lives, and I am uh, deeply indebted to you as uh, as the person who represents uh, a district that is uh, quite often and historically marginalized. 
I'm very grateful to you. Captain Ta, uh, I, I'm always grateful to all of the work that you do and uh, you're always very uh, accessible to myself and to my team. And so, you know, we have such a great relationship and I, I you know, to be able to have that kind of communication with your elected officials and to quickly be able to pick up the phone. I can call up uh, Captain Ta at all hours of the day and night and he's, uh, he's so accessible to all of us. And I know that all of you are, are probably doing the same thing with, uh, with your representatives. So I thank you so much for the time that you've given us and for really your commitment and your passion to serve the community in the way that you do such a, in such a dignified manner, especially in a time where people are really really very uh, scared about what this pandemic really means uh, to our community. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Thank you, Assembly Member, for bringing us all together in this venue. And thank you for bringing uh, to our attention such important issues. Great. Thank you very much. I, again, thank you all for joining us. A, a quick message from CHP, drive slowly uh, on our freeway. And uh, again, a reminder that is that you really, if you see something, say something. I think that's the one way that us and the community member be able to help with the public safety officers. So be safe, be healthy, and be happy. We'll see you in the next uh, virtual town hall.